Let's take a look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is one of the main conflicts in the Middle East and one that creates um, tension and problems uh, and has for many, many years. Introduction to this, we've already talked some about the area of Palestine and some of the things that happen uh, after World War I when the British take this area over. But in general, um, it's a conflict over land and borders. I guess to put it simply, so you have, um, in fact, three units that exist today um, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You have uh, what is normally would be called Israel, right? And some people include this whole area, but for our purposes here, it's this area. Plus, you have the Gaza area of Gaza, or the Gaza Strip, as it's called, and then the West Bank, which you see here. It's the West Bank of the Jordan River. So it's these two areas, then, in um, who are where Palestinians live, um, although there are Palestinians that live in Israel as well. So these two areas then were taken over, uh, taken control of by Israel. And um, the lines that you see drawn here is what happens when Israel originally is formed in 1949, when they move military forces in and they take uh, by force this land. Uh, they have uh, armistice lines drawn in 1948 and the state of Israel uh, will be formed at that point. So this happened through military action, settlement, uh, population growth now. So this has created the situation that we have today. So it gets complicated, like a lot of things do, especially in the Middle East, uh, over this land. And it's a relatively small piece of land. It's about the size of the state of New Jersey, all of this land that you see pictured here. All right, we've already talked about the Sykes-Pouchot Agreement, but it's important to bring it back up here. This secret agreement that comes about during World War I, where Britain and France, and Russia gets involved in this as well, and basically it's part of the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire and what are they going to do with this land? Well, um, their agreement, which is never fully carried out, uh, is listed here. And here you see different colors. Uh, French control in the sort of blue and purple areas. Um, British control in these red and pink areas. And then you see this green area, which was to be an international zone. Well, of course... It didn't happen quite this way. The agreement was never implemented. Uh, but it did set the principles up and uh, the guidelines, and in many people's minds, you know, the places where the countries would form, the, the colonies, the mandates would form after the war ends. So the French and the British are going to come into this part of the world, the Middle East, and they are going to control it, uh, maintain it, um, oversee it as a mandate. And basically, uh, what will eventually form out of these areas are the countries of Syria, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, and Palestine. Eventually, Palestine will be split into the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and uh, Israel. So here we see the British mandate. Israel, uh, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and Jordan now is called Palestine. You can see it here. Here is Palestine. And then across the Jordan River and across the valley is the Transjordan or the Transjordan Territory. It means trans means across. Across the Jordan River, uh, this is the land. And of course, up here you can see Iraq. 
is divided off of this rather strange panhandle of uh, Jordan. And again, for example, this border between Syria and Jordan, um, there is no natural boundary. There is uh, a natural boundary up here. There's a river. But once you get all the way out here, uh, all these lines, all these angles, these are all somewhat artificially drawn. Uh, there is nothing there but desert. Well, these had been former Ottoman territories, and uh, of course now the uh, Europeans are going to move in. The League of Nations is officially um, the ones that take control of these French and British mandates, but since it's such a weak organization, it's really uh, up to the British. The British control this area from about 19, 19, 1920 to about 1948. And so we see um, some changes in that in 1923. Britain granted limited autonomy to the Transjordan. And of course, this is now called Jordan or the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan today. Um, but of course, the, the other side, Palestine side, um, you know, increasingly, as I mentioned before, in the 19th century, um, there was a Zionist movement which wanted to bring uh, a Jewish state to this area. And once Britain had control of it, 1919, 1920, then uh, the Zionists um, began to negotiate uh, with the British to try to see to make this happen. Well, um, what will happen is, is we'll see lots of settlement of Jews um, coming into this area after the Balfour Declaration Agreement. Um, and uh, this just keeps growing. And the British keep having more and more troubles with this area uh, because, well, some people get rather militant or violent. There, there were... Uh, uh, Zionists who captured British soldiers, held them hostage. They blew up hotels and things. They did what we might call terrorist activities to do this. And uh, they also came up with a plan. So finally now, after World War II, when the United Nations comes into play, we see that a partitioning plan uh, comes on the table. So this is the UN partition plan um, drawn up in 1947. Basically, it was set up so that these areas that are more, I guess, what would you call them, tan, orange, these areas are uh, the areas that were primarily Palestinian or Arab population. This was to be, uh, this was to be the territory of uh, Palestine or an Arab state. Whereas this area that's in the green uh, was to be Jewish territory or a, a Jewish state or Israel. Uh, you can see that it's, you know, very difficult. This would be very, very difficult to work out because it, in fact, divides up um, Arab territory from each other with a narrow strip here that connects uh, Tel Aviv and the coast down to this part of uh, the Negev and the southern part of the hillands. And notice that it leaves uh, Jerusalem out of this picture as an international city. Um, so this, this partitioning, as it's called, partition means a division of, this, of the land of Palestine between uh, Arab and uh, Jewish states. Of course, this was never ratified either, and this idea of Jerusalem as an international city also did not happen. It's rejected by native Arabs, that is, Arabs who were in this area. Most of the Jews who are negotiating this had moved in, mostly from Europe. Uh, they didn't like the plan because it divided their land, and of course, they weren't all that happy with the whole idea uh, of it. Uh, and of course, you can see also it divides Jewish land up here along um the upper part of the uh, Sea of Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, is divided from over here by Haifa. Well, it was never implemented. Uh, and so that brings us up then to the founding of the state of, of Israel. Well, 
the conflict could not be resolved. And so, in fact, fighting broke out between the, uh, the Jewish uh, settlers and the uh, Arabs uh, who were in the area. Um, the fighting, uh, a war, we uh, broke out in 1948. Uh, this happens, why? Because the British just left after World War II. They left the land, they left the problem, and uh, they didn't have a solution, so they just took off. And so it broke down into fighting. Uh, the Jews will then declare uh, that they had won, which basically I guess they had. They had taken all the land here except for the Gaza Strip and this area, which is known as the West Bank. And so all of this area, they said, well, this is now Israel, and we have a country. This is a country. Um, this will bring neighboring uh, Arab states get involved with this, with Palestine. Um, but after eight months of fighting, so eight neighboring uh, Arab nations like Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, uh, but after eight months of fighting, um, they, you know, this is about where it ended right here, which you see on the map. An armistice line was agreed, a ceasefire, and um, this is what establishes then these two geographic entities, the Gaza Strip, as it's usually called, and the West Bank. Okay, so you can see them here. Um, these are distinct then geographic units. Um, politically, of course, it leaves it up in the air because Israel is not recognized by everyone. Eventually, it will be recognized by the United Nations and some other countries. But these other territories were never in that initial uh, rendering of Israel. So what are they? Are they their own country uh, and so forth? Well, what happens then between 1948 and 1968, um, if you look very carefully, it's kind of hard to see on the map here because uh, it is, you know, covered up by the little block that says Jerusalem. Uh, the Israeli forces, the Jewish forces, had pushed their way into Jerusalem. If we go back and look at the previous map, you see... <coughs> that the predominantly areas that were Jewish did not include the areas right into Jerusalem. So they had pushed into this area uh, in order so they could lay claim to a part of Jerusalem, which they did, the west part. Basically, Jerusalem, of course, is, as you know, is a very ancient city. But once they move into here, they begin to build up this western part, which really was not a city, and um, becomes very important symbolically and, and so forth. So from 1948 to 1967, uh, this is the way uh, things are, okay, for about 20 years. The West Bank and East Jerusalem ruled by Jordan. It's actually placed under the administration of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Um, the Gaza Strip is under the military administration of Egypt. All right, so this, since they didn't have their own country, didn't have their own economy, for example, in the West Bank, it's considered to be um, uh, Jordanian territory. They use uh, the same money as Jordan, um, and so on, same economy. Uh, Israeli troops uh, had moved down into, in 1956, they will move into Egypt and take over the Sinai Peninsula and the Suez Canal. Uh, this is, you know, something we don't have time to go into in detail, but the Suez Canal crisis of 1956 was a coordinated attack, a coordinated plan between Israel and Britain and France, because uh, a leader named Nasser, who was running Egypt, had nationalized the Suez Canal, and um, basically the British and the French were getting excluded. So they collaborated with uh, Israeli. They, they told Israel to 
basically say you're, you've been attacked by Egypt, threatened by Egypt. Uh, you come in and invade uh, the Sinai Peninsula, which is very lightly uh, occupied. It's mostly desert. And at the same time, we will say we're coming to your aid, and we'll go in and, and bomb the, uh, the airports, the planes, keep the uh, Egyptian, we'll sort of uh, take out the Egyptian Air Force that way. Um, and then, since when you advance on the uh, canal, uh, and of course the Egyptians will be coming the other way, we will come into the canal zone and uh, say we're going to protect it from this conflict. And so they had paratroopers come in and they had ships offshore. And so basically, uh, after the Suez Canal is uh, nationalized, Israelis uh, colluded with uh, France and Britain to take over the Sinai, uh, to take over the Suez Canal, and they took over the Sinai Peninsula. So basically, you know, the idea was Israel would withdraw and uh, these European forces would control the canal. Uh, so they would win. It would be a win-win for them. This is the, uh, the, this is the deal. Of course, this is happening in 1956 when Dwight D. Eisenhower is running for re-election. And uh, he has not been notified of any of this. He doesn't like it at all. And uh, he basically threatens uh, that the U.S. will come in and take out the British and the French forces and turn things back over to Egypt if they don't withdraw. So they do withdraw. However, Israel does not withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula. And so this sets up uh, a situation now where the Sinai Peninsula is under Israeli control. Um, there's a peacekeeping force there of uh, United Nations uh, troops. But in 1967, now some nine years have passed, Nasser um, wants this land back, and he orders the UN troops out. He begins to make some aggressive moves. Uh, he blocks Israeli shipping routes in the Red Sea, and Israelis take this as an act of war, uh, and then a war will break out. Israel will launch its troops um, into the Sinai Peninsula, and, uh, and then others, once they attack Egypt, then Jordan and Syria join in. This brings about what is called the Six-Day War. The Six-Day War. So the Six-Day War, before the war, take a look at the map. Here's what it looks like. After the war, take a look at it, you see. After the war, of what basically happens in the Six-Day War, and it l literally does last six days, um, Israel makes a preemptive strike on Egypt. Uh, this draws Syria and Jordan into a regional war in 1967. And in the end, after six days, Israel gains a whole lot of territory. They come in and they occupy the Gaza Strip. They occupy the West Bank. And they actually take the Golan Heights from Syria and uh, this from Egypt. So, uh, you know, depending on how you want to look at things, they took land from Egypt. They took land from Jordan. They took land from Syria. And uh, they decisively won this war in six days. Well, this creates even more tensions now uh, because uh, Israel is not, you know, Israel is being very active in the area. Uh, 1956, 1967, these are um, seen by the Arabs as aggressive acts and uh, so forth. Well, now what comes about is the idea of land for peace. And we'll talk about this again towards the end of our talk. But the land for peace idea is the idea that now Israel has this land which is taken. It can now trade this land uh, for peace, for recognition. Because these countries, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, for example, had not recognized the legitimacy of Israel, that it was uh, legitimately a country. Because they said it, it was taken over. It's uh, you know they uh, they took over the land uh, without provocation, and they uh, have just taken the land, and they don't rightfully um, shouldn't rightfully have a country. Well, if the Arabs will recognize Israeli borders and the right to security, then uh, there could be a deal. Now, this does work out between Egypt and um, Israel. Egypt and Israel. 
They have meetings in 1979. We've talked about that somewhat, Camp David Accords. And eventually what we're going to see is a peace deal will come about, be arranged, uh, time of Jimmy Carter as president, and uh, for uh, turning over this land, Israel gets recognition by Egypt. By the way, both of them get very sizable foreign aid packages from the United States to encourage this to happen. This is called the Camp David Accords, and the leader of Egypt is Sadat, the leader of Israel is Bacon, and of course the leader in the United States is Carter. By the way, uh, shortly after this agreement, Anwar Sadat is assassinated by an Egyptian who believes uh, that he has uh, sold out in making peace with Israel. Well, let's take a look at Jerusalem. Jerusalem becomes a problem area and, of course, still is in many regards. Uh, here's what Jerusalem looks like uh, before 1967. Remember I said uh, the Jewish forces had pushed uh, into the western part of, uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, you can see it here. And then, of course, they're going to slowly uh, be uh, building up areas in the west right up to the old city. This, this brown, darker brown area is the old city of Jerusalem. And so first they're out here, then they begin moving, moving, moving right up to this line. Of course, this other line here, this lighter blue line, is uh, the area of East Jerusalem. And this was controlled by uh, Jordan um, from 4950 to 1967. Okay, and then you see these pockets of uh, Palestinian Arab areas that are in this greenish color. So it gets very complicated. But at the end of 1948, Jerusalem is divided into two parts. You have the east part and you have the west part. East part is Palestinian Arab and the, and the uh, west part is Israeli. So by 1967 then, Israel... Uh, we'll move out of the west part, take the, has the west part, but now we'll take the eastern part. Again, very controversial because this includes the old city, which is walled. Uh, this has places that are very holy, sacred to Muslims, including the Dome of the Rock and the Alaska Mosque. Uh, these are, and Jerusalem, by the way, is considered to be the third most holy city in Islam. This is part of the reason why Jerusalem is always a, um, an area of tension because, of course, it's, it's important to the Jews uh, where the temple had been built. It's important to the uh, Muslims because uh, they believe Muhammad visited here, the Dome of the Rock, and uh, important to Christians because of the connection with the ministry, crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus. So, uh, you know, this makes Jerusalem then... Uh, a very unique city, and one where there's a lot of there can be a lot of tension. So uh, before 1967, this is the way it was. Uh, you had this controlled by the uh, this was controlled by Jordan, Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and the Arab Arab Muslims primarily, and uh, this area was controlled by um, Israel, uh, a Jewish state. All right. Uh, then, of course, when the war, a six-day war takes place after 1967, we see that Israel captured all of Jerusalem. You can see it now uh, encircled in this blue line uh, and including a lot of Arab territory or Arab uh, majority uh, population territories, all these sort of lighter green areas. Um, and, uh, you know, not just population, but houses neighborhoods, you know, really this is urban area. So um, all the way up towards Ramallah, Ramallah up to the north. Um, and so um, in 1980, Israel formally annexes East Jerusalem, claims that all of Jerusalem is, you know, it's not just occupied territory, this is Israeli territory. So the city status was in dispute. Um, Israel's occupation of East Jerusalem is considered illegal under international law. 
uh, the United Nations and so forth. That's why it makes it very controversial. And uh, Israel uh, determined that Jerusalem was going to be its capital, and not just its capital, but its undivided capital. Now, of course, the Palestinians, uh, they call Jerusalem Al-Quds, uh, and of course it has these holy places for them. They wanted Jerusalem, at least East Jerusalem, to be their capital. Uh, and of course this then uh, is, uh, is a problem. So you see how complicated it can get. So here's the city of Jerusalem. Now let's move and talk about the West Bank for a moment. The West Bank. Uh, the West Bank, uh, you see close up here of where there are populated areas. Um, and what we see by 1993, uh, they, they have the Oslo Accords, and then there's a Declaration of Principles, which in principle says that the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are going to be independent. Uh, they're going to be their own country, basically. They're going to be Palestine. Um, and so, uh, in fact, uh, the Israelis do begin to hand over control some control in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And it comes in mm, slowly, right? But still the Israelis, you see all these roads, these main roads that are I outlined here. You know, they're, they're going to control the roads. So to limit the movement of people. You can see here uh, eight different um, urban areas, cities. Uh, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, Janine, Nablus, uh, Ramallah, Jericho, so forth. These are some of the main uh, Pal Palestinian population, main cities of Palestine. 59% um, was under Israeli uh, civil and security control. 23% under Palestinian civil control. But you still have Israeli security control, that is, uh, roadblocks, uh, checking people's IDs, uh, slowing down movement from one place to the other. So uh, the big centers where the Palestinians actually controlled was right, right around Jericho in this dark green, and then up here uh, to the north around uh, Janine, you can see, uh, in this area here. Well, uh, so... 23% under Palestinian civil control, 18% under Palestinian national control, 59% under Israeli civil and security control. And of course, all these areas subject to Israeli incursions. Uh, so you wonder, why is the area so tense? Uh, well, you know, it's supposed to be, uh, at least in theory, an independent state, but of course it's not. Uh, movement is curtailed. Uh, for example, if you have family in... Um, uh, down here in uh, Hebron, uh, Hebron, and you want to uh, go up uh, to Janine or go to Jericho to see a relative or whatever. Um, not always able to do that, or it's not always easy to do that. Uh, because, in fact, the even the cars are easily identified as whether they're Palestinian or Israelis. The Israelis have yellow license plates, Palestinians have blue license plates. So uh, at a roadblock, uh, at a road security check, they can very easily line up all the blue, uh, all the blue tags go through very quickly, um, or the yellow tags go through quickly, the blue tags off to the side and have to wait. And so a lot of stories come out of that about, say, pregnant woman trying to get to the hospital, has to wait in the um, has to wait in the line for security and actually gives birth in the car, doesn't make it to the hospital, and so forth. So, why are there tensions? There's all kinds of reasons why there are tensions that are here. So here are the population centers, and these are very fast growing because Palestinians tend to have a lot more children than Israelis, and so their population is growing. It's a fast-growing population. Um, so we see these numbers are from a few years ago. Uh, this is like almost 20 years ago now. Um, and uh, so we see that, you know, these are the areas that are really growing quickly. Now, the other thing that also complicates this is that the Israelis have set up settlements inside the West Bank, 
which technically they're not supposed to do, but they've done it anyway. And uh, they've, they've um, that is they, the Israeli government, has uh, built um, government-subsidized apartments. They've made it desirable for young Israelis to move in here. Um, and of course, you have to remember that every Israeli is in the army by, uh, I mean, there is, each person has to serve in the army, active duty, and then basically for much of the rest of your life, you are in the army reserve. So technically every Israeli is in the military uh, to some extent. So you can see um, there's 2.2 million Palestinians. Uh, there's uh, about a quarter of a million Israeli settlers living in the West Bank. Both of these populations are growing. Um, I recently saw numbers for the Palestinians, and it's closer, the West Bank, it's closer to 5 million. It's doubled in about the last 20 years, and it probably will double again. So this creates even more tension because there's limited resources, there's more people, and so forth. So 6.7 million people in Israel, 1.3 million Israeli Arabs, and that's out in this other part out here, not in the West Bank. And of course, those Arabs are also growing. Uh, they got citizenship um, starting off, and they are now Israeli citizens. So this also creates some tension because their population is growing faster uh, than the rest of the population. Well, here is just a map showing the Israeli uh, settlements in the West Bank. Um, all these areas that are uh, in these little dots of blue, those are Israeli settlements. Uh, settlement blocks, that is territory that's kind of blocked out by them in the yellow. Uh, so about 2% of the West Bank is, uh, has Israeli settlements. Um, it's linked by roads. These roads are controlled by the Israelis. Large tracts of Israeli-controlled land are also designated as nature preserves or military areas. This also uh, gives Israel control over that, keeps people from building there, moving through those areas. So this is part of the tension as well in the West Bank. And then you see here is just a list uh, or a, a description of checkpoints, all those little black uh, squares are places that people would be stopped if you have the blue license plate. Uh, and of course now today, the things have changed. Most people with yellow license plates aren't even going to enter this area now uh, because they've now built a wall all the way around it. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So uh, Israeli troops have encircled and moved into population centers. Uh, there's a restriction of Palestinians. And this wall that I was talking about, it began in 2002. It is now complete. I believe it's all done all the way around the whole perimeter uh, from, uh, from the river up here, Jordan River, all the way around, all the way down to Jerusalem, all the way down around this way and back to the Dead Sea. Now, still these areas... Um, you know, I don't know about the river area. I've not seen the wall there, but it comes down to the river. And then uh, there are there is access from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea uh, on those roads. The tourists do that regularly. So um, anyway, this, when I'm talking about a wall, I'm talking about a major, major wall. It is uh, a concrete wall. Now, sometimes uh, Israelis don't refer to it as a wall. They call it a barrier. Okay, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a major, major area there. So here, here you can see a map of the entire area with the, the wall, the barrier, whatever you want to call it, and how it's going around the entire perimeter here. This is basically blocking off uh, all of this Palestine. And notice how it encircles in and has gathered in these Israeli settlements into these areas as well. Some of them are behind or secured by the wall. Not all of them, though. Some of them are still not um, within the wall. Uh, so when I say it's a wall, uh, this is what I'm talking about, as I showed you. This is uh, 
major thing. You can see a person down here. So let's say that they're about 6 feet, 6, 12, 18, 24 feet high, you know, probably uh, uh, 9, 10 meters high with barbed wire on the top. They have guard towers and so forth. Now another uh, hotspot area is the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated tracts of land in uh, anywhere in the world. Um, at the time I did this, uh, got this data, there was 1.3 million Palestinians there. I'm sure it's more now. And this is a very small uh, area. It's really just uh, you know, like three miles long, four miles long. Um, also, it had within it Israeli settlements. And then you, know, you have cities like Gaza, Gaza City, and so forth. Um, so this becomes real tense. You, know, you wonder why, why would the Israelis go and settle in these areas? They're going there for a political purpose. They go into the West Bank. They go into the Gaza Strip. They put up a settlement. Um, they very clearly define their area. As, uh, uh, as Jewish, as is Israeli. They put up the Israeli flag. They carry machine guns. I mean, it's to make a statement to say, this is our land. This is not your land. And we're going to live here. And you're not going to stop us. That sort of thing. And so it, it's defiant. And it's uh, confrontational. It's intended to be. Uh, and within this Gaza Strip is a lot of poverty. Um, the other thing we've not talked about is, is that when uh, Israel formed in 1948, many people in the territory that they took over that were Palestinians actually fled the territory. They were afraid uh, for their lives, and so many of them left. And they went to refugee, what become refugee camps at first, tents and that sort of thing. It was meant to be temporary housing in places like uh, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, and so forth. Uh, and of course now, some more than 50, 60 years later, these refugee camps are still there. And so Gaza was uh, has a lot of refugee camps. About a third of the people live in UN-funded refugee camps there. Uh, but as I said, uh, about 10,000 Jewish settlers live there until August of 2005. By the middle of August 2005, there were none. Uh, why did they leave? How did they leave? It was very controversial. And in fact, the Israeli army had to come in and forcibly remove many of these settlers who did not want to leave. They had to basically drag them out, uh, handcuff them, lock them up, put them in a truck, haul them out of there because they turned over the Gaza Strip to... Um, uh, to the Palestinians. Now, um, and, and then they have made a very secure border all the way around it. Um, between Gaza and Egypt. Um, and so, and, and all the way around the Gaza Strip. You see that Egypt is, is right down here, Rafa. So, um, in essence, the situation we see now is that uh, the Gaza Strip is now uh, devoid of any Israeli settlements. Um, it's turned over to, um, you know, all of it's turned over to the Palestinians. So they had covered about 30% of the Gaza Strip, now none. Um, there are still some Israeli security zones uh, but I think most of those have left as well now. And, uh, but Israel still controls all external borders, all crossing points. Uh, they still uh, will come into this area if they think they need. But, I mean, it's, it's an urban area. It's sort of like going into a city. Basically, almost the whole thing is, is uh, heavily occupied. So, very different situation than the West Bank. Uh, by 2003, uh, the Israelis had handed over control of the main north-south highway back, uh, back to, to the Palestinian security forces. So as the Israelis withdrew, um, they uh, set up um, 
a way to protect themselves, uh, I guess you'd say. And uh, they're going to maintain the borders and, and the, even the coastline. So uh, we know and now in later years, uh, more recent years, that they have put up a blockade on uh, ships coming into the Gaza Strip and also uh, uh, to coming in from Egypt. So they are, it's an island. It's sort of a city that is walled off to itself. In fact, some Palestinians call the Gaza Strip a prison, a giant prison. And the West Bank, now since it has a wall around it, some people have called that a walled-in prison where Palestinians are forced to live. Now, some people aren't that extreme about it, but certainly you get the idea that they are locked in here. So since that time, uh, since 2005, now in more recent years, uh, there were elections in Gaza, since it is now uh, autonomous, so to speak, as much as it is. Uh, they had elections. And up to this time, it had been controlled by the Palestinian uh, National uh, Assembly, um, but Hamas uh, is very popular in the area. They have done a lot of things with giving out food and education and that sort of thing, and their popular, popularity grew. And so uh, 19, in 2006, 44% of the people voted for Hamas. They got the most votes. And um, Israel, of course, didn't like this because they had an agreement with the other government. They had made that agreement to pull out their forces and all that uh, with the other uh, government. Uh, but Hamas said, no, we're not going to honor uh, what those guys did. We're not going to recognize you uh, or whatever. And so Israel then imposed a lot of sanctions on the Gaza Strip. Fatah. Fatah is the name of the uh, Fatah is the name of the government in now the West Bank, and it was the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And so, actually, Fatah and Hamas uh, fought with each other in 2007. Hamas wins, and uh, we see this is when stronger um, blockade of Gaza was placed there by Israel, uh, and also with Egypt um, on the Egyptian border to really cut them off. Uh, as a result, uh, now the Palestinian territory is really divided. I mean, it was already geographically divided. Now it's politically divided. You got the Gaza Strip under the Hamas. You got the West Bank under Fatah. Now here you see a picture of guys carrying a missile, uh, a rocket. Um, these rocket launches um, started to take place in earnest, and they still happen, but. Um, they were happening so often, basically these guys would launch rockets because they're very close. They could launch them into Israeli cities. Uh, some even went as far as Jerusalem, but the other areas nearby. Uh, another thing that they have done in more recent times is they have uh, set up um, balloons. Uh, balloons, they've just set up you know, anything they could get to float. They put fire on it when it's very dry. They uh, build a, a little container with a fire in it. And they put balloons and set, let the wind blow the balloons over into the grassy fields and the areas. And, you know, they start fires that way. Um, and then these rocket launches. And so in uh, December, January 2008-2009, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, said they were going to go in and take out these rocket launching sites. Uh, they called it Operation Cast Lead, and they went in, and it was fairly bloody battles in there uh, for about two months, six weeks, um, and uh, they did take out a lot of the sites, but it, it didn't end it really. There was a ceasefire, and we see that uh, the rocket launches still happen, and then they have to negotiate for a ceasefire. Let's have a ceasefire for a week, a ceasefire for two weeks and we will negotiate, and so forth. So this is an ongoing tactic uh, still happening today. Now, a lot of these things uh, also to try to solve these problems, uh, there was a, uh, a UN resolution uh, clear back in the uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago, 
And this was UN Resolution 242, and many times people make reference to it. So I thought I would just put it up here, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. But basically it says the United Nations um, wants peace in the Middle East, okay? Uh, basically says they affirm uh, the principles requiring establishment of just and lasting peace, all right? So there should be two things, two principles to follow if you're going to have peace. Number one, the withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. And the recent conflict they're talking about here is uh, the, the uh, Six-Day War. Of course, it can then be applied to other areas as well, like uh, the, the Golan Heights. Uh, and then, of course, so on the Israeli side, they are to withdraw out of these territories they have taken. And then uh, on the other side, they need to terminate uh, all their uh, belligerence and all their claims, say, to the state of Israel and to acknowledge it as a country. Okay, that's basically what this is saying. Uh, so this has come to be called land for peace. Because uh, several countries still today do not recognize Israel uh, as a legitimate country, nation, uh, and some are still technically at war with Israel. Uh, at this point, uh, Syria, I guess, technically is still at war with Israel. Um, perhaps Lebanon as well. Um, this idea for land for peace then, the idea that Israel will give up land to secure recognition and have peace. So here we have the symbol uh, for this, that there can be coexistence of Palestine and Israel. Uh, up above in Arabic here, you can see it says Salam. And down here in Hebrew, it says Shalom. Very similar words. They mean the same thing, peace. Um, so this land for peace is based on that UN Resolution 242. This is what happened with Egypt and Israel in 1979. It also then brings up what is normally called, often called, the two-state solution, where in fact you would have a state, the state of Israel, of course, but then you would also have a state of Palestine, and that they would be existing side by side and in peace. So this is the, uh, this is the question, of course, it has never been resolved. Uh, it's a difficult one. Every... U.S. president pretty much has tried to come up with an uh, Israeli peace plan. All of them have failed, uh, and other people have tried as well. And, of course, the question of Jerusalem that we've mentioned is very important. This idea it was an international city. Now they both want it as a capital. So, uh, as we mentioned, the Knesset, the Knesset is basically the parliament of uh, the modern state of Israel, the government. They issued a law in 1980 which said that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel and that, uh, that they control all of it. Um, most countries have not recognized uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Um, they still use Tel Aviv, which is the economic center of Israel. And uh, finally, in December of 2017, Donald Trump um, issued a statement that the United States was recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So this has created more tension, uh, but uh, you know this is this is where it stands right now. There there is the, you know they're negotiating for peace, but um, you can see all the problems we have in the Middle East. A lot of them come back. Uh, to Palestine because it becomes a, a place where, you know, the division can be recognized or exploited. So we're going to end it there for right now.